Hello everyone and welcome back to COURS, our course on commercial open source startups. We are starting now the third part of three. In the first part of the course we looked at the software industry, in the second part of the course we looked at open source and in particular commercial open source and now in the final part we will specifically look at startups as part of the industry and then startups uh, which are commercial open source software startups. So for this we first have to understand startups in general and we will go through the definitions and the growth phases of a potential startup and some relevant metrics because that helps us best understand it. This lecture is based mostly on these uh, books, which is common standard by now, The Lean Startup uh, by Eric Ries and uh, uh, the Customer Discovery Process, respectively here, The Startup Owner's Manual, a second book by Steve Blank. So perhaps the key takeaway from this whole lecture that you have is that a startup is not a small, a small version of a large company. It's something entirely different. And that's because a startup as a budding company is not a company and does not yet know how to earn money. So a startup is an organization in search of a viable business model. It's key to understand that your focus, if you are in a startup or if you are leading a startup, is to lead that search and to make that search successful based on which you have or discover a business model that works and makes the startup, which is usually running on borrowed money or investments, uh, make it sustainable. Startups need to utilize innovation because the established markets, established products are all taken and it's really hard to get in. So you need to find something new. Uh, doesn't mean you already have a business model or you have a viable sustainable organization, but you need a starting point. And here are the core sources of innovation that you might turn to. We are, of course, particularly interested in the University Research Lab. It has a certain profile, which is that university performs research that is considered in general both high risk in terms of invention, innovation. If it was low risk, universities wouldn't do it, professors wouldn't be interested. And also it probably has high customer market risk because otherwise it's uh, much more profitable or much more easily funded by industry. So industry, for example, understands that if it could only determine a cure for cancer, then it would have a low market risk. There would be plenty of customers. So the University Research Lab gives us innovations for a startup with both high innovation risk and high market risk. The innovation is paid for by the university. But if you build a startup on it, you're still facing high customer and market risk. The high market risk means that your search process is also of higher risk and you need to do it well. So um, going back to this possible idea you might have that a startup is just a small, a small, small version of a company, uh, that will make you fail. What will also make you fail is that if, if, if you believe that your great idea or that great university invention, innovation, is kind of self-explanatory, people will obviously understand what it is and why they should buy. So if you believe your great idea or that great innovation is obviously what customers want, you may be wrong. Um, if you think there's no need for adaptation or iteration or learning, you'll end up wrong. And perhaps worst of all, if you think you can do this process by bringing in 
or by working with people from established firms who have not that search process in mind, you're probably also going to be wrong. The basic idea is that way too often the entrepreneur strongly believes in their idea, their vision, and believes what it is that customers need. And so everyone really just needs to execute their master plan. And that is the road to failure. What you need to do instead is establish and follow in the genes of that startup a structured process of what uh, those aforementioned book, books call incremental and in particular validated learning. Where this process leads to discovering your business model. You don't know it yet. And there's quite the gap. It's not just that your innovation or invention may be no good. It's just that even if the innovation, invention at its core is viable, you have no idea in the beginning usually how to actually bring it to market, how customers want to receive it, and how you can make money of it. In the words of uh, Reese and Blank, what you're doing is going through a process of creating, testing, and evaluating hypotheses. I do believe they deliberately borrowed from science, though the hypothesis testing is usually not as narrowly defined as you might think when you hear it. Uh, so these are not controlled experiments. They are nevertheless experiments, field experiments, by which you test your ideas in the marketplace and have set up your organization and its search process in such a way that based on these tests and whether they succeed or fail, you readjust, you adjust, you steer based on the results of the test, you steer based on a continuous feedback loop in which you engage, that you create and that you drive. So you start with an idea, you have to start somewhere, but you should not make the assumption that this idea pans out. To learn what works and what doesn't, you have to engage with your customers and your markets. Uh, many authors have put it in this form, into this form, into the saying there are no facts inside your building, meaning get out, talk to people, and that will start the feedback loop. The business model canvas in this context then becomes your tool. Remember, if you're a large company, you already have a business model. You can plunk down, you can put down into these sections with a good understanding based on many years of business, what the key partners are, what the channels are. Hopefully, not always, but hopefully. Now, with a startup as an organization in search of a viable business model, this Canvas becomes your thinking tool that reminds you of the things that you may have to look at, but that you are also experimenting with until you think they stick, until you know they stick based on metrics that we will discuss. So the business model canvas is your conceptual thinking tool for documenting what your current thinking is, how you might go about changing it, what to test where your, where your open questions are and how and where to test your hypotheses. It is your externalized brain. It is a documentation of your search process and your future steps in the search process as you're planning them. So you'll go through many stages, or so through many, many iterations of this business model canvas as applied to your different situations, your different hypotheses, in time. One of the most coarse grain but also most important perspectives on time is that you are, uh, even though you are searching, ultimately still going through stages. So ideally uh, you go through these three stages um, where you are finding so-called problem solution fit first. So the search process is trying to guide you through these three stages of finding problem solution fit, finding product market fit, and finding channel product fit. And what that means is an ever 
larger extension of your idea turned into a working business model addressing different scopes, different dimensions. So problem solution fit is what you reach, the fit, when there are customers who find value in your proposition and buy. There are customers you can sell, you're making money, fabulous. So your value proposition properly address, addresses a problem and your value proposition is the solution to that problem and customers agree. That's an important signal. Does not mean you have a scalable business model yet. So beyond selected customers or even small market segments, you really want to match the whole market. The difference here is that initially with problem solution fit, your solution fits individual customers, but you don't know yet how really from a product management perspective, you go beyond these individual select customers for who it fits to the actual market. What really is the core and the essence of your product that makes it fit a whole market, all the customers in that market. And then some bells and whistles, perhaps to address some customers, but fundamentally does the core of the product, the essence of your product, uh, propose a value that customers buy, do you match the market? So if you have that, you have product market fit. And even with product market fit, you're not entirely there yet because you can still and also build product channel fit. Different markets or different variants of your product with varying core propositions may need to reach customers in different ways. So you may have different channels by which you reach, reach the uh, customer. So you have a product channel fit which allows you to scale out your business. And that's when you have a successful startup, at least the type of Silicon Valley startup that many are angling for. So what you do in, these, uh, in the search process, of course, is that on the one hand, you are uh, generating ideas to go beyond where you currently are. So you are building the business model in your mind, which takes the form of uh, effectively hypotheses, or it can take the form of hypotheses about how things would work better this way or that way. But you don't know that yet because they are hypotheses. And then in that other activity, you test the hypotheses. So you create hypotheses while you're, while you're building your business model and then you test the hypotheses to validate they are true, like in scientific terminology. So let's take a look at the first, uh, first aspect here. Business model building as hypothesis creation. So at the very beginning, there's only the creative spark of the entrepreneur or the innovation from the research lab. Once you put that into motion, of course, though, you uh, generate more ideas based on, can generate more ideas based on the feedback you're getting. So you establish that feedback loop from which more sparks fly and uh, you, from which you evolve the idea about what could work and what might what could not work. So you're creating these hypotheses as assumptions that you want to test whether they are true. And this testing process then uh, takes this following takes the following form. Of the many hypotheses that you may have generated, you pick those of highest relevance to you. That is important. You probably will generate a lot of hypotheses just where should you spend your time and effort? So it's not necessarily obvious and it's quite a challenge and uh, requires intelligence to figure out how to prioritize your various hypotheses. Where's the biggest bang for the buck? Anyway, you select them. You then design an experiment, think about a way, find a way of how you will get an answer to your hypothesis. Is it true or false? That happens to be an important aspect of hypothesis that I didn't mention. Do not make it a qualitative statement. Make it a yes or no statement. Is this true or not? That's a hypothesis, not a it may be answer. 
So you design an experiment to test the hypothesis and then you carry out the experiment. And that's the hypothesis test in which you gather data about customer behavior, user behavior or something else you're interested in. And based on that, and then you have that data and you analyze it. So that's where you derive the insights, including ideally a clear answer, yes or no. The original hypothesis is true or false. Most likely, or often, you'll, you will still get a qualified answer of the sorts. It's roughly true, but it might have been better if this or that was the case, which in turn lets you in the next business model building uh, step uh, revise hypotheses, evolve hypotheses uh, to refine your business model. Effectively, this leads you through iterations on your business model as you move things forward and refine your business model. You can really think about it as one iteration in which you write down your hypotheses as a proposed business model using the business model canvas, and then you test those. And based on the tests, you devise a new business model, uh, here iteration two, and you use a separate canvas. And then you test that, and you learn, and then you create a third one, and so forth. So you have that sequence of business model canvases, and ultimately a whole branching tree from that original spark of potential business model canvases that show your history of exploring what your business model might be. I said a branching tree. Ideally, it won't get too complicated. Your goal is not to create a big tree. Your goal is to find that viable business model. So be very judicious, obviously, in how you evolve your business model and so forth. The uh, different dimensions you might want to uh, look at is, of course, um, the variance, how you vary your product, how it varies for different uh, uh, markets and um, how the mechanisms between the different components of the business model uh, can be varied. There is a large number of dimensions effectively, how business models differ among each other and you will have to manage that search process uh, almost like a hill climbing process in AI. What you have to do if your hypotheses all return false or with unsatisfactory results is at some point of time to understand or accept that perhaps that such direction has led you, led you into a rut, meaning you're not going anywhere. The underlying hypothesis that there is gold to be found here is just not true. If so, uh, you have to change direct direction. That's called a pivot. Uh, you pivot meaning you turn around and march or search off into a different direction. Ideally, of course, you have a linear procession of steps in the right direction. Maybe you recognize the gradient, maybe you know how to march up that hill, but uh, that's not always going to happen. In a few cases it might, and then you're lucky, but more often than not you'll have to pivot or change direction significantly because some of your assumptions did not pan out. And you shouldn't, shouldn't view this as a failure, but really as important learning. Uh, naturally, if all you ever do is pivot, you'll end up spinning around and that's not going to help either, but um, uh, no pivot would be unusual. So yes, you may have to change direction anyway, just not all the time. With this mental model of a startup being really a search process, you are, you are spending your time wisely. This is perhaps the most efficient perspective because it, it's, it, it is most time efficient. You are not going to spend a lot of time on things that don't work because you get fast feedback that they don't work. It's the difference between agile and waterfall in software development. Um, you have very short feedback cycles until you learn whether something works or doesn't and you design things in such a way that these feedback cycles 
circles are short. As you do so, you also know that, well, it might not work and you might have to try many more things, which makes you more prudent, more frugal. So you will most likely be more resource efficient because you test before you invest too much and you realize you may have to test some more or way more. So you need to save what you spend. So it makes you more capital and labor efficient. Which is not to say that there's any guarantee you will end up somewhere. Obviously, your intelligence and perseverance are important, but experience also is. The basic model I worked off for that I used to explain the search process on a more coarse grain level, meaning going through stages of problem solution fit, product market fit and channel product fit. These were coarse grain stages in each you may be in that search process. And it's well possible that you think you progress, but you cannot find product market fit after problem solution fit and have to fall back to problem solution fit. In any case, this particular uh, model of these three fits is not the only one. I'm using the common industry terminology here, which is these three models, but there are others. So actually Reese, uh, Blank and Reese respectively uh, use somewhat different terminology, which loosely, not 100%, but loosely aligns with these three stages. They talk about customer discovery, customer validation, customer creation to identify the different stages of growing and taking qualitative leaps or steps in your business model. So let's take a look, uh, a more detailed look at the first, uh, first challenge, finding problem solution fit. I will rely on or will use Blank's customer discovery here. So customer discovery is the search process that tests whether well the business model fundamentally works. Um, you have the idea, you are not sure about your customers yet and your value proposition for them. The value proposition may have to change or your focus on who's your customer might have to change. So there's a matching with at least two variables, the value proposition and the customer segment or the market segments. So do customers want it? Or will they pay for it? And in the search process, it's really the, the very first step. That's where you start with your fundamental value proposition from the university research lab or maybe your own creative spark. And that's an idea. Um, maybe you already put it into some tangible product. Maybe you wrote some code, but what about the different market segments. How, what about the channels and how to get it to customers, how to build out those relationships to make more of customers, what's the revenue streams you can generate and so forth. The business model canvas helps you focus on understanding that all of these aspects uh, need to be considered and many if not all of them will be relevant for a full-blown business model so they have to be addressed over time. The common advice uh, on how to search, how to climb that hill, where to focus first is to look at market sizes, assumed market sizes. So as you define your customers, you can also see what markets they constitute and how large that market possibly is. We have at least three different types of markets. There's the total market. You probably, uh, that fits your product or your value proposition, but you will never really fully reach that for various reasons, because maybe you're not being allowed into that market at some other country with some weird requirements, what have you. So in the total market, a part of it is the addressable market. That's who you can possibly reach as you grow. 
But in the beginning, you won't be able to address everyone there because, well, you are still growing. You don't even have the capacity. Maybe you don't have core functionality yet that the whole addressable market needs. What have you? Uh, you simply identify yet a smaller set or aspect or part of the addressable market called your serviced or serviceable market because that is what your product will initially or can possibly do. Market sizes are relevant for various aspects, for various reasons. Um, you have to like the market, of course, uh, the value or why you're doing the company. But the market size is relevant as to how much revenue you will be able to generate, whether that fits your needs on the one hand, but also the needs of any potential investor. If your startup is of the type that it needs upfront investment and you can't or don't want to grow it using your own funds or uh, you can't grow it or don't want to grow it in a profitable way, then you need outside investment and you will only get outside investment if the market size that you can reach is large enough. If it's not large enough, investors will not be interested and you will not get investment and you cannot start and run your company because you run out of money first. There are different types of uh, markets, so they determine what hypotheses you generate, how you generate them and so forth. And uh, I suspect many hope they can create that new market because the product is so groundbreaking, it's something never seen before. But sometimes you just take an existing market into a different context. You clone the market. Uh, there's nothing dishonorable about being a copycat and uh, bringing a good work, well working work, well working value proposition to a market or a country that has not been served it yet. You can look at existing markets and do better. You can restructure existing market. There's all kinds of opportunity out there. It does come with constraints or consequences though. Um, some things don't go together well and so you really need to understand is your product new well then it's a new market and you need to deal with that you can't really bring it into an existing market and um, so cloning is perhaps the easiest and if you want to get started as an entrepreneur maybe that is how best to learn being an entrepreneur certainly if you consider being a serial entrepreneur Here's some classification by example. I would argue that uh, um, uh, some of the most successful companies really just walked into existing markets by cloning a business idea. So all the database companies are like that. Certainly if they are of existing database types, they really just enter uh, um, an existing market and maybe they did something new like moved things into the cloud or went from sql to no sql but ultimately these are some of the most successful and valuable companies or startups so how do you go about finding problem solution fit so again we are back to the search process and in its first step uh, it is building out the model, meaning creating hypotheses that uh, test the various aspects of a proposed model. Take a business model canvas, put down hypotheses about what your value proposition is, who are your customers, the channels, how you reach them, how much money or what money it generates, how and what the costs are and so forth. From this really if you put down something, a value proposition is this or that, that's a hypothesis, or it can be turned into a hypothesis. Then you need to find out how to test it. So um, channels, for example, um, uh, digital, physical, and so forth, and the products we have also well known. Our focus here again, of course, is software, digital product with digital channels mostly. Here's some example hypotheses. Um, uh, associated with the different categories of the business model canvas. 
on the one hand you can be initially descriptive so you describe uh, the, the market segments you're in when you're working on market or customer segments what they want etc and then you turn that into a hypothesis by saying our market is this or that uh, well that's a good hypothesis is an open question but you do that so that now you have something with a possible yes or no answer that you can uh, test and um, that's what you do in open source you have some simple ways of getting answers to hypotheses uh, because as people use your software the open source software in a natural way you just get a hundred thousand so well depending on how many users you have you get experiments for free you can see what people by themselves do it it has the disadvantage that you can't quite manage them although of course through community management you might lead them somewhere but at least they're doing it by themselves and you have no costs or low costs uh, costs only based on the community management you need to need to provide mostly so they're just doing it and so you can learn in product management for hypotheses and hypotheses test what what the community wants so uh, so you listen to them you talk to them you can run simple surveys if you've established places for them to come like your website or your forums or your forge and you engage with your community and your open source community is a great source of hypotheses and hypotheses tests with very little cost to you even with an open source community uh, you still should run your own experiments so naturally occurring experiments by an open source community do not free you of the need to create your own more or less controlled experiments so these can be very simple you don't need to write code you can just create some advertisements which link to something where there's a website which says we will provide you with this feature or this app do you need that is that a good idea if so register your email address here and we will inform you once it's ready that's about as low key and simple as it gets and the activation of the visitor is do they care enough about providing the email address that means they must be interested there must be a market need and then you look at the relationship between people who you reach by your advertisement and those who eventually provide the email address very simple very effective not that expensive and so you get the necessary steering information whether you should dig in there or not digging in means sooner or later creating something called the minimum viable product beyond a basic web survey or some web interaction with a user that gives you some indication you of course have to start building a product you just don't want to build an expensive complete product only to learn that it doesn't do what customers want you want to create a minimal cost product where minimal or minimum means not so much costs but minimum viable feature set um, the minimum functionality that users need or want so that the value proposition the core of the value proposition is there which means that it's a real test it does something useful for users it's not just a mock-up not just some idea uh, that they can play with but it actually provides value and they can use it and that uh, users can customers or users can use it and that also means it is a key hypothesis it's a complex hypothesis because it embodies the whole value proposition I mean the, it embodies the essence of the value proposition uh, even though it keeps costs uh, down so here you can see it um, even though I said that the minimum viable product should be a product some view all of this as just stages of escalation and this is how I present it here uh, the MVP 
over various stages, over four stages here, uh, becomes the full-blown uh, product. Low fidelity means not at all polished, so you can learn from that do customers engage, even if it's not necessarily completely satisfactory. Um, does it solve some problems so they actually keep using it? That will increase acquisition. Is it of good quality so that users are happy about it? This will grow users. And eventually, is it so good that you can scale up operations? Well, that's the final step here. So you go through increasing complexity of the minimum viable product, which ultimately won't be that minimal any longer. But you build it out. And again, it's a search process. And you can change direction along the search process if you are not able to reach the next step. And the hypothesis test suggesting this is the direction, this is the direction you should take, tell you it's actually not the direction. It's into the abyss or against the wall. And again, then commercial open source, or open source in general, these experiments can be provided by you to the community or the community does it themselves or you guide some of the community to develop some of the software. This way you can both scale out the experiments at low cost by, well, not unloading costs, by letting the community do some of the work. And uh, that may be in both parties' interests. With the designed experiment, well, you run it and you test it and so forth. In uh, open source, uh, you can see the uptake of users. For example, if your users created something, and of course you can try to bring it in-house. You should obviously do that judiciously and uh, in such a way that, uh, that you don't annoy your community. If you have an innovation or invention coming from the community, it's probably not going to be a closed feature. You'll have to keep it in the open part. But additional functionality, complementary functionality, usually comes with it that you can keep closed, can have that as the closed complement that makes users become customers and pay. With uh, the experiment defined and run, you gather the data um, and then analyze it and get an answer to your hypothesis. In open source, again, you can do uh, that openly. You can really engage with the community uh, about some functionality that the community developed or something that you provided, uh, maybe only partially and left open for completion through the community. You can discuss with your community whether it works or not, whether it's a good idea or not. And um, you can take some of that close, but come back and discuss it further with the community and so forth. What you need to watch out for, of course, is that the community of users consists of uh, both your potential customers, but also parties who may never buy. So you need to judiciously observe who is saying what and who may be a representative of your customer and giving you ideas and insights into what features you should have in the future that will help you grow your product versus something else that is only relevant for those who will never buy and therefore maybe you should leave it to them to do it themselves. Well, based on what you learn, you have to decide do you pivot or do you proceed and that's what you do. So the second stage, of course, once you have product market fit, meaning your value proposition reaches some customers, but uh, is not entirely uh, fulfilling full market fits, is, well, you need to look at, are you really, you need to find out how to really define that value proposition that is being sold, but how to refine it and determine how to 
how to define it in such a way that it really nicely uh, sub subly subly <laughs> uh, matches a whole market segment so not just individual customers with a lot of sales effort but really a whole segment with a natural match between the value proposition and what the customers in the market segment need. So again, you're in a search process where you're really now validating the whole market uh, segment. In product market fit, you uh, identify customers and have an idea about the value proposition. But again, you want to address a whole market now. So how do you test for this is it for not just select customers by chance, but um, can we grow this to the whole market? Um, is it scalable? Uh, and ultimately, should we invest more heavily to actually scale it? That's the underlying question because every entrepreneur wants to scale, but nothing is worse than premature scaling because it's throwing out money, means throwing out money. Simple tests for uh, scalability are whether customer lifetime value will clearly exceed customer acquisition cost. Uh, that remains the core metric or test for will you be profitable long term. Um, also, and that's key of not being in problem solution fit any longer, but being in product market fit, is the customer acquisition process predictable? And has your, has your sales funnel in a positive way calmed down and is flowing steadily? Yes, of course, it's a funnel. You lose customers, but the throughput is there. So you have stable ratios between the different stages in the sales funnel and you have a consistent output. So this predictability there, that would be a test to see whether you reached product market fit. And here again, like in the uh, problem solution fit stage, um, you have to go through the full cycle of uh, Generating hypotheses, you pull out the business model canvas again, or more better yet, you have it uh, available uh, all the time anyway. So using the business model canvas as a thinking tool, you generate more hypotheses, you focus on which segments of your overall market are perhaps most promising, uh, you focus um, less on, you. in addition to what you focused on before in problem solution fit. Um, you also focus on the too many secondary aspects like what are the channels and relationships that we need to build on the channels we need to sell through. So you test those more effectively now uh, by generating hypotheses first, then designing an experiment, building out the MVP to give you a possible answer to a specific hypothesis and try to direct that to the various channels. Then with that MVP, you test it. I test your hypothesis. You need to make sure you can gather all the relevant data. Um, you can, uh, since you have an added focus already on channels, uh, see or try to segment better and get different varied answers and to your hypotheses by segments and other parameters. And then in the end, like before, you analyze it to get answers to your hypotheses. An important aspect is um, demand creation in uh, general, but in open source, you can use uh, the various marketing strategies available for open source in general. And then even though it's better with community open source, also for commercial open source. So uh, use social media, use your community, um, have your practitioners, have your users, and empower them to give conference talks and so forth. And again, like in problem solution fit and product market fit, 
you have to look take a hard look at the results of your hypothesis tests and uh, you may be experimenting but if you are learning you cannot go beyond your customers the haphazard customers you get like in problem solution fit it is not scalable it's not repeatable the sales funnel is not predictable at all and you are not entirely sure what the specific aspects of your value proposition are that makes customers buy well then maybe you have to pivot but if you did well of course you can proceed Proceeding then means uh, moving on to the last stage of product channel fit. That's when your product really fits the channel. So your product is customizable or exists in variants or can be presented in different variants where the features available to customers ultimately are matching the, mark, uh, are matching the channel by which the, you reach the customer and that will give you that desired growth possibly even hyper growth and later consistent uh, throughput now let's take a look at some startup metrics um, the basic matrix are the same like in every business um, because you want to be a business <laughs> I said you're a startup as a, you're in a search process that's correct but you're still always nevertheless angling for ultimately how are you developing towards the metrics that classic model businesses are also uh, measured by um, so for you even as a startup customer lifetime value is relevant customer lifetime costs are relevant of which the uh, customer acquisition costs are the most important part. Usually they are the biggest part, but uh, anyway, your key of course is again that you want lifetime value to be much bigger than customer acquisition. You look at the uh, rev um, recurring revenue, the uh, either monthly or annually, uh, to see whether your revenue is growing. You may want to distinguish this into uh, new customer revenue and existing customer revenue and how that changes if your revenue so, so sales people tend to focus on on acquiring new customers because that's also where they usually get the biggest uh, commissions um, but for the startup the growth of revenue from existing customers is also very important because it means that your value proposition really sticks um, customer lifetime value goes down significantly if you lose a lot of customers but uh, even if they just keep using your product and don't buy anything else then it may be okay if your product is built that way but ideally say in a traditional cloud software what you want is that your product keeps growing inside customer companies meaning the revenue from a single existing customer also uh, grows so if that growth is there then you have the uh, ultimate proof arguably that your value proposition really reached your customers and that's of course what you want to show that's what of course what you want to learn for yourself and what you want to show potential investors in case you still need money you still need money in particular in the early phases and in particular and we will talk about that later if uh, you are trying to grow uh, on investors money rather than out of your own strength and uh, in such a situation you need to obviously manage your money at hand actually the cash not just the book value because you need to know how quickly you're burning through any reserves or investments and how much time how much run rate you have left um, if you are managing towards uh, break even well then you need to uh, figure out when the break even will come uh, if you keep growing like that but that is an issue of different strategies 
are managing to become profitable versus managing to grow uh, as fast as you can and we will revisit that uh, later as well. Uh, with that I think uh, I covered the basics of uh, software typically startup though it was pretty general today um, and you may have seen the Silicon Valley type of startup in here already but I will revisit this in the future lectures. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention and see you uh, in the next session.